Good evening. I wish we were all sitting in someone's living room. It would make this much easier, you know. <laughs> um, I, I don't uh, much care for formal presentations, I mean, from my part. And uh, this theme is so immense and so vast that it's a little bit uh, overwhelming uh, in its proportions. As I was thinking about it and looking at the various quotations on so many different aspects of the love of God, it occurred to me that maybe I should have titled the talk For the Love of God. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I came to my good senses and I've tried to organize something for you. The, um, it seemed to me that the material this time through, and now you'll be able to uh, critique this yourselves because this is not a subject that you're unfamiliar with. It's right at the center of your being, the center of your consciousness. So uh, excuse me if I repeat things that we've all heard over and over again. I mean, we all have heard that we've been created to know and love God. But we're hoping that somehow with the quotations we could bring a few, uh, perhaps a few new facets to our understanding of, of the subject. I find that it divides rather conveniently in seven uh, topics or seven themes, which I'm going to mention to you. Then I'd like to go over these themes and talk about some of the principal little points that are in those, uh, under those topics, and then some quotations in connection with them. The first one is the love of God with respect to creation and nature itself, the very foundation of existence. The second one is the love of God and the manifestation of God, who, of course, is the source and sustainer of the love of God. The next has to do with love and knowledge of God. That's very closely related to love and the human spirit, what the implications are of the love of God for us as individuals. Then there's quite a bit in the writings, and especially we're talking about serving the divine plan, quite a bit in the tablets of the divine plan about the love of God and how we must become instruments for the distribution of the love of God. So love and teaching is another topic. And then there's something that I've, I've kind of to myself called the higher calling. It's to do with love and sacrifice. Love and Baha'u'llah's call for martyrdom, things that are a bit uh, more challenging than our everyday existence here. And finally, the love of God as a key to the uni unification of the human race, which of course is one of the great goals of the cause of God. Please click like for this video and subscribe for more great content. We find, with respect to creation and nature, that the love of God is the very cause of creation. We find this in various quotations. It is the force which gives life to the world of existence. It causes the progress of all things. It is the foundation of all creation. It is the cohesive power between atoms and the magnet that holds planets in their orb. In other words, it, it, it lies at the center and the periphery and everything else you can think about. This love of God emanates from the manifestation of God to us, consists of special gifts and favors. Of course, the creation itself sustains us. We're, we're supported by it. But through the manifestation of God, we come to develop consciousness, if you will, of the love of God in creation, inherent in creation. And that then becomes one of the sources for our marvel, for beholding his beauty, for seeing him everywhere reflected in creation. This uh, love that comes from the manifestation is intended to transform itself within us as love for our fellow creatures. It's not sufficient that we should love God, but the outcome of that is that we should love each other. 
This is a love that brings with it the descent of divine blessings. As we turn to it, as we um, reflect it in our, in our own spirit, in our own reality, it attracts infinite blessings to us. It's the means of drawing close to God, nearness to God. The love that flows from, from the manifestation of God to our realities awakens in us a desire, an attraction to draw close to him and through him to our creator. We're told that it allows us to penetrate and understand all created things. It causes us to learn whatever is unknown to us about the universe and the divine doctrines and teachings. In other words, it is very closely aligned to knowledge. I would say knowledge, this interplay between love and knowledge is, is very interesting. Uh, Abdu'l-Bahá explains that we, it's first for us to know and then to love. And in another place he says, knowledge is love. Now what kind of knowledge is that? If you'll recall from the Igan and the tablets of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Bahá, he talks about knowledge being a light that God casts into the heart of whomsoever he willeth. We're not talking about uh, acquired information here. We're talking about turning to the source of all knowledge and then learning from that, drawing our understanding from that. And that, of course, produces this marvel in the soul and causes us to love God. And that causes an increase in knowledge. And that causes an increase in love. And so it keeps cycling forth. Love is the means of producing spiritual awakening in us. It's God's love, God's love that has caused him to send the manifestations of God to the earth to describe for us the purpose of our existence. All of this is related to uh, our response, if you will, to that call, our turning of the mirror of our inner being, so, so to speak, towards that love and letting it become the means of cleansing us and purifying us and focusing us. In another place it says, love is the essence of courage and power. It's the source of courage and power for us. It provides joy and true happiness to us. All other happinesses are ephemeral and passing or are dependent on certain conditions which once fulfilled don't make us any happy, happy anymore. We're hungry, and we get to eat, we're happy. But if we've already eaten, more food doesn't make us any happy anymore. So Abdu'l-Bahá explains that the nature of love is something permanent. It always produces joy. It always produces happiness in us. It opens the pathway to the kingdom on high. And it's, it's interesting to think of that when we think of kingdom, we... <clears throat> perhaps think of some realm or something. Of course, the kingdom of God means where God rules. And you're in the kingdom of God if you allow God to rule in you, if you have uh, instilled into your being, attracted to your being, his instructions, his will, then you become a citizen of that kingdom. You become a dweller in that kingdom, and you receive the benefits and uh, all of the riches of that kingdom. And that kingdom, singularly, in some of the definitions of Baha'u'llah, means the most great beauty, means the manifestation, means Baha'u'llah himself. Turn to the kingdom. It's, you know, oftentimes the manifestation uses phrases and words. He's, instead of saying, turn to me, which he sometimes says too, but he oftentimes says, turn to the kingdom, you know, where Abdul Baha will say that in such a way. It gives us uh, an a different way of looking at the manifestation of God. He wants to tell us that he's the best beloved of all the worlds. He produces a maiden, which is the, Shoghi Effendi calls, the personation of his own inner reality, his own inner spirit, who announces to the world, this is your best beloved, turn to him. There's a kind of a modesty there, I think, that's part of the divine uh, nature that we see repeated over and over in the writings. So it leads us, it, it puts us on the pathway to the kingdom of God. It also, he says, that love of God removes all obstacles to our progress. 
What could be more essential than that? He says it purifies and cleanses the human spirit, and then it intoxicates and ignites the soul. It illumines and brightens the faces. It's interesting to see uh, Abdul Baha writes back sometimes his tablets. He says, the pictures that you sent have been received. And we see the light of the love of God shining in the faces of those individuals. And Abdul Baha, in the divine plan, he says, we should become the embodiment of this light of the love of God. And he said that he, he wants us to become incarnate light. And in a tablet, he says, from the top of your head to the tips of your toes. It adorns men with virtue and purity. It illumines and brightens the faces. It causes the spirit of life to fill the heart. It causes the heart to be blessed by God. It causes the development of spiritual susceptibilities. You find this thing in the writing several places, and sometimes in the prayers. That is that we should become sensitive to the impulses of the, of the spiritual world. And they should react on us. We should, uh, we should not be torpid and dull in our responses, but we should be ready to receive all the impulses of the kingdom and all the effects of the prayers we say. It makes our hearts luminous. It changes one to a flame of fire. It enables one to find peace of mind and conscience. It is a power of great faith which possesses the heart. It frees one from human imperfections. It guides to the acquisition of the perfections of the world of humanity. It illumines and makes radiant the souls. It causes all traces of self, ego, and desire to be removed from the heart. It inspires us to observe the fast for the love of his beauty. It makes our eyes weep with pain because of our separation from the court of God. So it also tends to admonish us and lift us. The flame of love consumes all save the remembrance of God, which is the only thing that should really remain in the center of our being. Is this awareness of this love of God, awareness of this divine remembrance, awareness of he who is the remembrance of God. It mortifies or deadens corrupt desires. Sounds helpful, doesn't it? And corrupt imaginings. The love of God, the effect of the prayer, relieves us of this tendency we have to carry on and imagine all kinds of things we shouldn't be imagining from what we see around us. It causes the image of God, the face of God, to be imprinted on the heart and the beauty of God to be revealed to the soul. It makes one to eagerly observe the laws of God. And through this love of God, one inherits eternal life. It frees us from turning to our own selves and to all things other than God. It causes us to be entirely his, knowing no one but him, seeing only him, and thinking of none other. I desire to be loved alone and above all that is, is Baha'u'llah's admonition in the hidden words. What does that mean? Above all alone and above all that is. What are the implications of that for every other kind of love that we have, which should derive from that love if it's to be legitimate and acceptable in the sight of God? With regard to love and teaching, the effects of love attract the hearts, and it awakens and revives those who are spiritually dead, the effect of the teacher. This is where now we're talking about teaching and the influence of having the love of God in the heart of the teacher. He says, it causes words to flow from one's lips like strings of pearls. It makes one's words to take effect in the hearts because of the confirmations of the Holy Spirit that are inherent in this love of God. It causes one to respond correctly to questions when they're posed, Abdul Baha says. When you possess the love of God, you'll be inspired to give the right kind of answers to questions that you're asked. It produces marvelous effects in the listeners. It moves one to contribute to the funds of the faith, he says in another, in another place. 
is through the love of God, the torch of the soul illumines all regions. And he calls on these early believers that went out to new regions to uh, shed the love of God on that vast territory through the pulsing of their hearts, through their attraction to the beloved. It causes the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to be heard from the lips of the teachers. He says, through this, all sickness and ailment will be healed by the contact of the hands of the friend. The recipient radiates the divine effulgence on others. With regard, again, to love and sacrifice, this higher calling that I mentioned earlier, it causes one to withstand all the swords of the earth and inspires one to abandon one's home and seek after tribulations. It causes us to desire not life, to see life in death, and to seek glory in humiliation. Mysterious, mysterious things, dimensions that we don't, I think, often uh, ponder on. With respect to love and unity of mankind, the establishment of the most great peace and the kingdom of God on earth are directly dependent on the love of God taking possession of human hearts and infusing with the spiritual benefits that it brings the human race. That is the cause and foundation, we're told, of this most great peace and the world civilization to come. It removes the darkness of enmity and hate from amongst mankind. And Abdu'l Baha says, nothing else will suffice in this respect. The only way we can go forward and unite mankind is through our becoming the embodiments of the love of God as shining forth from the heart and reality of Baha'u'llah. It unites our hearts. It removes conflicts, he says, between capitalists and workers. The solution to the economic problem, he says, is the love of God. When people eventually perform philanthropic acts because of the love of God, then the spirit of it is right. The reward that they receive is correct. The attitude of the recipient will be also inspired by seeing the motivation of the giver. It stills the winds of discord amongst the friends. It moves one to serve mankind. And it inspires total dedication to the beloved. And we've all uh, perhaps have seen references to the different kinds of love, four kinds of love, five kinds of love. There's a place where Abdu'l Baha says, indeed, there are infinite stages of love and degrees of love and kinds of love. So it's, like, it's kind of like the 12 principles. After you get into it a bit, you find that sometimes there's nine, sometimes there's 11, sometimes there's 13. It, there, there are principles, and there's a group of them, and Depending on the occasion, Abdul Baha expands the explanation or not. So I have a few here that you could say, oh, well, why does that one say five and the other one say four? Well, it's just this based on this principle. With respect to this, uh, Baha'u'llah in the Seven Valley says that the journeys in the pathway of love are reckoned as four. The journeys in the pathway of love, that is the comings and goings of love, if you will, are four. From the creatures to the true one. From the true one to the creatures. From the creatures to the creatures. And from the true one to the true one. Maybe this last one is the most mysterious to us. Abdul Baha elaborating on the same theme in one of his talks said that uh, there are five kinds of love. First, the love of his own perfections, which caused God to create, that his beauty might be made manifest and appreciated. God, in his own inner essence, is witness to his own beauty, and this produces this longing and love that this beauty might be known, and through that he emanates the uh, very basis, if you will, the foundation of this love, this light, which creates the endless material and spiritual universes. 
Second, the love between sanctified souls for the attributes of the divine which they see reflected in one another. And this is this love of the creatures for the creatures. And Abdu Baha says there's some other means of attraction, animal magnetism and, and uh, uh, infatuation, if you will, that we have, be- individuals have between each other, that he says is not permanent, not like this love of God. And that that, that is a, a kind of love that's subject to changes. And we see how changeable it is in our own lives. And if you survey your life, I'm sure you can come up with some examples. The third is God's love to man individually. The degree to which we partake of the love that God shines on us. And that is gained, he says, according to the measure in which a man turns to God. Love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. Divine formula that requires us to put some effort in this subject. Abdu'l-Bahan, another place, he says, divine, the attainment of divine nearness is not easy. I think we all understand that <laughs> quite well. Fourth is man's love for God, the Creator. This is the cause of his life, of his progress, and his happiness. And it is the means, if you will, of inspiring praise in us, of our appreciation for God, uh, our glorying and wondering in his beauty. Fifth, and this is the, the difference from the other set, Abdul Baha adds this other dimension. He says the fifth is the love of self, which if directed to the ego, will deprive man of all true development. But if the love of self is a realization that one is a creature of God and must therefore attain to the station appointed for him, this love will be an uplifting one. So we want to watch for traces of spirituality in ourselves and rejoice in them. And if we see the other effects of ego and uh, carnal desires and all the other things, we, we must uh, burn those away, if you will, with the influence of the love of God. It's, uh, what is it? Consume every wayward thought with the flame of my loving mention. It's one of the requisites of the seekers in the Egon. Consume every wayward thought with the flame of my loving mention. This word mention can be also remembrance, could be praise. In other words, we're tempted where we're some uh, unpleasant thought comes to us, could be a criticism of somebody, whatever it is, we, we try to return our thoughts back to the beloved, who should be like a, a, a light, a flame, that is enthroned within the center of our being and informing everything we do, our thoughts, our actions, our feelings. Again, Abdu says the cause of the creation of the contingent world was love. Therefore, it's necessary that all should unite in the religion of the love of God. And the whole purpose of the religion of God is to bring love to mankind. It's an expression of the love of God. Delving a little deeper into these uh, themes, the question of creation in nature. Uh, the Kitab Yaktas, in the notes of the Kitab Yaktas, a tradition is quoted from Islam, but it's helpful because it's referred to in the Baha'i writings a number of times as well. We have the divine voice of God saying, I was a hidden treasure, I wish to be made known, and thus I called creation to being in order that I might be known. This wished to be known could also be long to be known or even love to be known. It still goes back again to the roots of love. And then Abdul Baha in a tablet, he says, the hidden essence of God, the hidden essence, became enraptured with its own beauty within itself. And this became the origin of all love and yearning and the source of all affection and ardor. And in the same tablet, he goes on a bit more, and he says, 
the pink in the cheek of young maidens is from that love too. Every expression of love at every level is coming from this love that flows from God to us. The love of God toward the self or identity of God, this is the transfiguration of his beauty, the reflection of himself in the mirror of his creation. This is the reality of love, the ancient love, the eternal love. Through one ray of this love, all other loves exist. Again, he says, for God is love, and all phenomena find source and emanation in that divine current of creation. The love of God halos all created things. Were it not for the love of God, no animate being would exist. Religion is the revelation of the will of God, and the divine fundamental of which is love. The basis of the will of God is love. Love is in reality the first effulgence of divinity and the greatest splendor of God. Love is the ground of all things. It's the expressive or creative foundation in all its degrees and kingdoms. We declare that love is the cause of the existence of all phenomena and that the absence of love is the cause of disintegration and non-existence. You begin to see how that applies then in our individual relationships. If there's a lack of love, we find discord disunity, envy arising between us. And the love of God in our hearts is the means of dispelling that, or at least bringing it to a level of importance where it doesn't disturb us and others. Love, he says, is the conscious bestowal of God, the bond of affiliation in all phenomena. The power of cohesion expressed in the mineral kingdom is in reality love or affinity manifest in a low degree according to the exigencies of the mineral world. And so if you come up and see in each of the kingdoms, the expression of love is there. In the mineral kingdom, it's cohesion, then it's the expression of growth, and so on. And you go up the chain of life. The cause of the creation, he says, of the phenomenal world is love. All the prophets have promulgated the law of love. Were it not for the love of God, no animate being would exist. What a power is love. It is the most wonderful, the greatest of all living powers. In the world of existence, there is indeed no greater power than the power of love. How we should hold to that in all of our activities and our concerns and our fears for our well-being and for the future of the cause of God and for the protection of the friends. The greatest power is the power of love. Again, we read, he says, consider and observe how the bestowals of God successively descend upon mankind. How the divine effulgences ever shine upon the human world. There can be no doubt that these bestowals, these bounties, these effulgences emanate from love. Unless love exists, the divine blessing could not descend upon any object or thing. Unless there be love, the recipient of divine effulgence could not radiate and reflect that effulgence upon other objects. I understand that to be the recipient here being the manifestation of God, who is the source of it, or perhaps ourselves acting in a field of teaching or of serving the cause, serving mankind. The realm of hearts and spirits is illumined and resuscitated through the shining rays of the sun of reality and the bounties of the love of God. Now, when you think about uh, the mirror of our own inner being, uh, he tells us that this has to be cleansed, that we all have it, but that it acquires dross from our interaction with the world and perhaps our negligence about carrying out the spiritual prerequisites and laws of the faith. And gradually, it, the effect then of the a mirror ha having the clear disk of the Son of Truth in it, of having all of that bounty flowing into it and reflecting out again, is, uh, is perturbed, is disturbed, is veiled. And he tells us that as we seek the love of God, that, that 
is, in a sense, the burnish of the Spirit that also cleanses the mirror. So the more we do that, the more the light enters. The more the light enters, the more we become excited, and we're able to go forward with that process. And this seems to be the means that God has provided for us to free ourselves from the uh, lower conditions of existence, to be able to arise to the level of what he's calling us to. Again, another one of these uh, broad affirmations. Although in the world of existence, the outpourings of the Almighty are infinite, yet the greatest divine outpouring is the love of God. Abdu'l-Bahá said that all the divine messengers have come to this earth as specialists of the law of God. I don't know what the underlying spiritual word, um, Persian word might be for that, but I think it creates an interesting image, and they, they certainly are specialists in the subject. They came to teach a divine love to the children of men. In this pathway, each one of these divine manifestations of God's love has accepted innumerable calamities and hardships. For the sake of the realization of love and concord amongst men, they've sacrificed their lives. In the, in the various tablets and the passages on the subject, you, you see them uh, hinting to us or calling to us directly to consider how we might sacrifice our lives in the same way, that it's this sacrifice of all things other than God that causes this uh, divine bestowal to appear in our reality, to shine forth. And that becomes the means of all the other activities that we have. When you think of the, of the culture of growth, it's the institute process, the core activities, all of these, uh, as you know from the institute books, uh, must be based on spiritual realities and spiritual attraction. But beyond that, we need constantly to uh, bring to bear the bounty and bestowal of God on our actions so that they'll be effective. We heard earlier how if we, if we do that, the, the uh, realities, the spiritual teachings will come forth from our lips like strands of pearls, or we will take effect in hardened hearts. In fact, Abdu Ba says that the, this hearts, hearts, some of the hearts are like stone, and it requires this fuel, if you will, spiritual fuel of the kingdom to be able to penetrate to them. And whatever mechanical apparatus we establish or processes that we set in motion, we must constantly re remember that we have to bring to them this basic influence of the love of God. Then this is the thing that smooths everything. I remember hearing Bill Sears saying that, like, found a, and I found this in the Guardian's writings too, he says, every, in the administration of the cause, every administrative action should be accompanied by an equal outpouring of love. Now think of that in your own actions, in your own life. The various things you do with each other and to each other, they require a component of love and of affection to, to do what they're supposed to do, so to speak. Well, all this seems a little overwhelming. You know, how are we going to get ourselves in motion and uh, live up to such a high standard? We all want to, but we also see our failings and... Sometimes we get depressed by it and we have to return back to the center. And Baha'u'llah is, of course, that center. And Abdu'l-Bah says to us, Beg everything thou desirest from Baha'u'llah. How often do we do that? How often do we do it? Of course, we have his words, his prayers, and we say them. And, but do we sometimes take our own words and address him and, and just make him know what we're worried about and what we're concerned about? Uh, create that uh, level of intimate conversation. Assured that he knows everything, he sees everything, he sees our thoughts, he sees our desires. There's enough quotations about that to frighten you from now throughout eternity. <laughs> he doesn't miss anything. <laughs> Even before you've hatched the reason and motive of what you're doing, he, he, he's aware of what's, what's there. So, big everything we want from Baha'u'llah. If thou art asking faith, you feel a little short in the faith department. Ask it of him, he says. If thou art yearning after knowledge, he will grant it unto thee. 
If thou art longing for the love of God, he will bestow it upon thee. He will descend upon thee with all his blessings. Beg everything thou desirest from Baha'u'llah. He says, if the people, if the hearts of the people become void of the divine grace, the love of God, they wander in the desert of ignorance, descend to the depths of ruin, and fall into the abyss of despair where there's no refuge. They become like the insects living on the lowest plane. Witness the state of humanity, who is now uh, out of contact by its own choice with the world of God and so in so many uh, areas of life. And uh, Abdul Baha says in one of his talks, the world of humanity is walking in a world of darkness because it's separated itself, it's divorced itself from this um, standard that we, we see repeated in the writings, the teachings of the manifestations of God about making the love of God the center of your existence. He says, the message of the holy divine manifestations is love. The phenomena of all creation are based upon love. The radiance of the world is due to love. And the well-being and happiness of the world depend upon it. He talks about what, what an infinite degree of love is reflected by the manifestations toward mankind. Coming back to this question of nearness to God is not an easy attainment. Divine nearness, Abba says, is dependent upon the love of God. Divine nearness is dependent upon attainment to the knowledge of God. Divine nearness rests upon severing oneself from all else save God. Divine nearness is contingent upon self-sacrifice Divine nearness, he said, is made possible through the baptism of fire and water, as stated in the Gospels. This is, of course, the talk he was giving in the West. And he talks about this water of life being knowledge, and the Spirit being the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the fire being the fire of the love of God. Until he attains to these three degrees, nearness to God is not possible. Let it be known that nearness to God is not dependent upon time or place. Nearness to God is dependent upon the purity of the heart. Divine nearness is dependent upon the exhilaration of the spirit. And this comes about through the glad tidings of God. In other words, the influence of the words of God in your own reality. Consider how a pure and well-polished mirror can reveal fully the effulgence of the sun. No matter how distant the sun may be, as soon as the mirror is cleansed from dross, the sun will manifest itself therein. It sets the hearts aglow with the fire of the love of God. The doors of knowledge are opened. Acquaintance with the mysteries of God is made possible. And so spiritual discoveries are made. In the Four Valleys, Baha'u'llah, there's one phrase there that seemed to fit in with this. He says, Wouldst thou that the mind should not entrap thee, teach it the science of the love of God. Now, sometimes our mind plays, you know, the practicality of things plays on us. And we always have to balance that with this what he calls the science of the love of God. He says this love of God, the beauty of God, is everywhere and exists for man if he will but rise to spiritual heights, open his spiritual vision, and behold it. It's not just there for saints. It's there for everybody. It's the heritage of the human race. It's the heritage of each one of us to witness the beauty and love of Baha'u'llah the love of God. The highest grace in man is to love God. 
Love of God, knowledge of God is the greatest, the only real happiness because it is nearness to God. This is the kingdom of God. To love God is to know him. To know him is to enter his kingdom and be near him. Happy is the soul that seeks in this brilliant era heavenly blessings, heavenly teachings, and blessed is the heart which is stirred and attracted by the love of God. Love is the source of all the bestowals of God. Until love takes possession of the heart, no other divine bounty can be revealed in it. Let me talk about how central it is. This, these quotes over and over again uh, just reinforce that. The love which is from God is the fundamental. This love is the object of all human attainment, the radiance of heaven. It's the light of man. Yeah, um, we're going to tell a little story about the love of God. Uh, early on, when I was here in the Holy Land, um, Rhea Conlon would often refer to her mother. She said her mother was not only her mother, but she was her spiritual mother. May Maxwell was, she said, the mother of my faith as well as the mother of my being. And she said we were... So she was my mother, but she was also like a sister, a kindred spirit. And she talked about the influence that her presence had. And the master has confirmed that. He's in speaking about Mrs. Maxwell in a tablet to someone else. He says, whoever meets her feels from her association the susceptibilities of the kingdom. Her company lifts and develops the soul. Now we see in that the model, of course, the master himself, when you think, what was his influence upon human beings? And he's our exemplar. So how can we, in our own lives, reach a stage where we would be able to have that influence on others by the grace of God? By the way, I found a quotation that, that says, uh, Abdul Baha says, the service of the friends belongs to God, not to them. If we're able to do anything in this faith for anybody, it's because of these divine confirmations and the effulgence of the kingdom, not because of our great capacity or we managed to pull it off or whatever we might think about. It. All that will just block, uh, block our progress. We have to, if we're able to do something, thank God you enabled me to do this, and really that belongs to you because you gave me the means of doing it. I'm finished with it, so we're detached. We're always detached. We don't know what's going to happen next. We can't kind of accumulate the effects of all of these things in our, in our life. God can accumulate them on our behalf if he wants and assist us and uplift us. Her company lifts and develops the soul. My goodness. Some of the Brazilians will have known about um, Leonora Armstrong. She was a marvelous, the mother pioneer, if you will, of South America after Martha Root made her trip through Latin America, opening a number of countries to the faith briefly with visits, but what visits they were. It, she wrote a diary. She came back to America, and she gave this diary, a copy of this diary, to Leonor Armstrong and encouraged her to go and settle. Leonora was a young, shy woman. She... Uh, was a little overwhelmed by that, but she saw all these promises in the writings. The drop will become an ocean, and the gnat will become an eagle, and all this. She went forth. She decided to go forth, and May Maxwell was the one that gave her the push, the final push. Leonora, I heard her, she told, told me herself, she said, I was there. I went to her bedside. May Maxwell was up and down, not too well, mostly weak, and but she had this uh, terrific spiritual charge. And she said, I went to her and I asked her what she thought I should do. She said, what, she, what do I think you should do? She said, go, what are you waiting for? <laughs> she said she half sat up in bed to say it. <laughs> and she said, that was all I needed. So she collected enough money to live about two weeks and got on a ship and went down to South America. And this isn't like, you know, 
call up dad and get a ticket to go home when you run out of money. This isn't, was, she was really out there on her own. And uh, with, with her faith in her heart and in her mouth, just <laughs> to see what's going to happen next. Oftentimes, think of her. She got there. She went to, first to Rio they landed, and uh, she asked for the address for the, there was a, she had the name of one contact who Martha Ruth said, this fellow's interested somewhat in the faith, go and find him. And she showed it to somebody and they said, oh, this is Santos, not Rio. You have to go to another city, get on another boat. So she got on another little, but smaller boat and went down the coast to Santos and went to this man's house. We can only imagine what he must have thought <laughs> with her appearing out of nowhere. It's this slight blonde, light, fair woman and asking uh, if he was so-and-so. And yes, and she said, well, Martha Root told me about you and that uh, she'd met you and spoken with you. Anyway, he hired her to teach English to his children, but there wasn't much else. He had to, somebody had, something had to happen, and that was his inspiration. And she lived in the, in the cellar of this place, which he said had more in it than me. All kinds of bugs and creatures. <laughs> <laughs> also, I had a little candle, a little lantern, and uh, people would come and peek through the crack to see, <laughs> at night to see me. So that is to <laughs> remain decent at all times. <laughs> and so she, she had this beginning. Now, after she was there about uh, two months, she received a tablet from Abdul Baha. The tablet was addressed, Leonora, Miss Leonora Halsapel, Brazil, and put in the mail by the master. <laughs> the master was the master. He knew how to do things. <laughs> I don't even trust UPS. I don't know what. <laughs> Anyhow, this letter came and and it was obviously Miss, and it was a, a, a Western name. So they sent it to the British Embassy. The British Embassy, we never heard it. We don't know who this is. We never heard it. They sent it to the American Embassy. The American Embassy says, we don't know who this lady is. But they stuck it up on a bulletin board. And one of the passengers that had been on the ship saw this and recognized her name and said, oh, she's in Santos. So they sent the letter to the consul in Santos. The Santos, in, they knew that uh, there weren't that many Americans wandering around those days. They got this letter to her. She receives this marvelous tablet. Heroic age. We're talking about divine plan in the heroic age, serving the divine plan. She says, you know, I spent years eating rice and banana. Sometimes that was the, all there was to eat for months at a time, she said. But she's come out and been recognized as the spiritual mother of South America. And Rio Conum said, the Guardian said, she was the Peter of South America. Anyhow, she had an English student later on in Salvador Bahia, whose name was Margot Worley, bless her soul, very active Baha'i. She was on the first regional National Assembly of South America, one of the early believers. Leonora was a little hesitant because she was teaching her English, and the lady was paying, her family was paying for her to be taught English, so she didn't say much about the faith, but she had formed a warm relationship with her. When she, this lady decided she was going to go to New York on a visit, so Leonora took the opportunity. She said, you must meet a friend of mine. Take my greetings, please, to May Maxwell. And here's the address where you can find her, and that was the Baha'i Center. So Margot says, I went to the Baha'i Center, and it was a night that May was speaking, of all things. And she said, but she just finished speaking. She came down off the platform, and they said, there's a lady here looking for you from Brazil, and she knows Leonora. Oh, my dear, you must come and see me. And she, so she invited her the next day for tea. So she said, I went for tea, and she said, uh, May Maxwell was looking just radiant, luminous. She said she had this long day gown on and she was lying on a chaise lounge and she was talking to me about the latest fashions and the different events in New York that she must. She said, and 
she said she was talking about these things, but something else was going on. She said, the only thing I could do, the only thing I could formulate, I couldn't register what she was saying, is that I must ask her what is Baha'i. So imagine what May Maxwell was doing besides talking about the goings on in New York. So finally she said, I mustered up my courage, and I said, Mrs. Maxwell, what is Baha'i? And she says she sat up, and all I can tell you is there was this tremendous impression of light and two rays of light came out of the pupils of her eyes. And she looked at me, and she smiled this heavenly smile, and she says, It's the Lord, my dear, the Lord. That's when I became a Baha'i, she said. <laughs> Rhea Khanum had Mr. Furitan read the tablets. She collected all the tablets that were here and the ones she'd had to her mother. And he reviewed these uh, tablets, and he said that he'd never seen tablets to anybody that had that kind of love in them from the Master and appreciation. You know, in the, in the various tablets of Abdul Baha, you see that he refers to, O oh, candle of the love of God, for example, he addresses somebody that way, or O oh, light of the love of God, or O oh, lamp of the love of God, O oh, flame of the love, we're getting up there now, O oh, torch of the love of God. <laughs> but only one person. Mr. Furtan said he ever saw addressed as, oh, firebrand of the love of God. And that was May Maxwell. That's the kind of ideal we can head to so that our company will lift and develop the souls of others, as he says in his tablet here. It's, it opens all the doors. It solves all the problems. It eliminates depression and uh, over-concern about our limitations. It transcends er everything in our life. Our whole being becomes another being through the love of God. In that respect, Abdu'l Baha made this call to the believers. He says, now is the time that the believers of God may imitate the conduct and manner of Abdu'l Baha. Day and night they must engage in teaching the cause of God but they must be imbued with the same spiritual state that Abdu'l-Baha manifested while traveling in America. When the teacher delivers an address, first of all, his own words must have a supreme and powerful effect over himself so that everyone in turn may be affected. His utterance must be like unto a flame of fire, burning away the veils of dogmas, passion, and desire. Moreover, he must be in the utmost state of humility and evanescence, that others may be mindful. He must have attained the station of renunciation and annihilation. Then, and not until then, will he teach the people with the melody of the supreme concourse. Uh, I remember hearing one of the friends say that the master one time commented, if one tree in a forest is ablaze, how can the other trees resist? And that should give fair payment and do to any of our complaints about the people just aren't receptive. Where I live, they're not receptive. You know, that's not going to work. That just not going to. It's not going to do it. You have to remember: if I'm the tree that's ablaze in this forest where nobody's ablaze there'll be no way that they can resist. So the solution to the teaching problems is not, you know, finding out what the people want to hear. It's finding out the way to say it so that it penetrates their hearts and touches their inner realities. I'd noted here also with respect to this story about May Maxwell that fellowship, remember in the hidden words, well, uh, several ways he says it, but he says, fellowship with the righteous cleanseth the rust from off the heart. Now, as we become, all become more righteous, then the communion of the community together has a terrific, terrific uplifting effect. Shoghi Effendi talked about the attraction of the Holy Spirit to gatherings where Baha'is are gathered. Now, 
I'm sorry, but I see you as part of the cream of the crop of the world here. And I'm sure that a gathering like this where you're all together thinking about spiritual things attracts marvelous confirmations. Are we feeling them? Are they having their effect in us? No. Beg of Baha'u'llah that he makes us <laughs> aware and mindful of these things so that we don't uh, in any way imitate the peoples of the world. That we become more and more every day the people of Ba. The divine plan, I was looking at the divine plan, that's a whole study by itself. But I found 20 places where he called upon the believers to exemplify the love of God, to attract the hearts to the love of God. There are not many places where he says, go and distribute pamphlets to the people. <laughs> There's some of that. Propagation of literature, promulgation of literature is important, but nothing like, may your words take effect in the hearts of the hearers because of the state of love of God that you feel. First prerequisite in teaching. The penetration of the word of man depends upon the heat of the fire of the love of God. The more the splendors of the love of God become manifest in the heart, the greater will be the penetration of the word. More secrets, how to teach the cause. I remember reading years ago, too, that they asked the master about teaching. How can they teach better? And he said, the kelidi tablik key to teaching, he said, is this, that you should shed loving kindness on the seeker, on the listener, and that that loving kindness will gradually cause him to love you. And when he loves you, your words will take effect in his heart. Now, sometimes there's not a lot of whole time for gradually. I know I also remember they told me when I was a new Baha'i that the Master said, if you're going to see somebody once, deliver the message. If you're going to see them more than once, live the life. It's like, you know, you move into a new apartment house and you come out of your door and there's somebody else comes out across the way and you say, oh, have you heard of Baha'u'llah? <laughs> it's a wonderful, sincere act, but not very timely when you're going to see them every day. Better to show some kindness. And use material that leads to them asking, why is it people so nice, you know? Now this question of the higher calling. Baha'u'llah says that if affliction overtake thee not in thy longing to meet me, how canst thou attain the light of the love of my beauty. You remember from the prayers, he says, but for the tribulations which are sustained in thy path, in God's path, how could the true lovers be recognized? Another place he says, I desire tribulations for the friends so that they will manifest the names and qualities of God. Seek a martyr's death in my path. For Westerners, that sounds very difficult. It's a, I think it's a question of attitude. In other words, if we're seeking annihilation of all of our lower qualities and attributes, it's the spirit of, of living sacrifice, of living martyrdom in a sense, to serve the cause with our whole being. We give our being to him and then we try to sort it out so that it's really for him. But of course, this question of martyrdom is a marvelous one. You want to... Uh, you know, you envision the end of your life, the happy end of your life with somebody taking care of you and changing your diapers for you, and you know, finally you dripped off with a cough and a sputter or something. I'm sorry, but if God should call you to martyrdom a little before that, maybe you don't have to give up your whole life, but at the, <laughs> there may be times when we'll be called on that. We should be ready, that's all. If we have an attitude of readiness to do whatever he calls upon us to do, this is what he seems to be hinting at here. It's, 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 a, it's a whole giving of ourselves, if you will. The hope of the lovers is self-sacrifice, and the yearning of the longing ones is self-effacement and evanescence. 
For love is an irresistible power, an inextinguishable conflagration, and the mirror of the love of God is the great martyrdom. It is the giving up of self. It's the dying to God and his living in us that becomes the whole symbol of all these things we're talking about. Hmm? He's referring to the lovers of the past. He says, they sought not an instant of tranquility. They experienced not one hour of safety, nor a day of repose of mind and body. This is the proof of the sincere lover and the evidence of the faithful friend. If it were not so, the remote one would become the near one, and the outcast would become the beloved. Consequently, the most great wisdom has ordained that the fire of tests shall rage and the rushing torrent of ordeals sweep tumultuously from the mountain of revelation, so that the untruthful may become distinguished from the truthful, the unrighteous be known from the righteous, the worshiper of self be separate from the worshiper of God. I think we're protected to a great extent from trials and tribulations here, despite the summer pastime we had recently. And it comes down for us in our lives maybe to, to become the embodiment of this quality of love, which includes the quality of forgiveness, which includes, as Abdul Baha so clearly states, the love of our enemies, the love of and good treatment of the people who don't like us or actually do things actively against us. It's easy to love the people that love you. He says that. That's not a big deal. It's the other ones that are difficult to love. My wife is, uh, always holds to the principle that she says if somebody's really not nice to you and really annoying you, you know, she says, pray for them. You pray for them because and I think she, she says that because as you're praying for them, your own attitude towards them somehow is changed. And God gives you grace to withstand whatever annoyance they have. But also, in some mysterious way, something happens to the other party. They can't quite, they don't know what's going on, but they can't quite be mean to you because <laughs> your, your spirit is okay with it, you know? It, you're not producing a conflict. There's no war there at all. Of course, it might not be helpful to tell them that I'm praying for you. But. <laughs> now, we all have our little annoyances, and the whole tenor of the world center depends on this quality of the love of God raising us to a level where these things don't matter, where we can forgive and forget. How many times do you hear that people say, I can forgive, but I can never forget? <laughs> or they say, I can forget, but I can't forgive. <laughs> Shoghi Effendi over and over, he says, forgive and forget. There's the only way beyond it. Some community is in terrible clash between the believers. How can we unite mankind if we can't get along with each other? And we can't get along with each other by looking for all the good qualities that we don't see in each other. I mean, some, sometimes we don't see good qualities, you know. We have to try, he says, Abdul Wah says, hold to the one good quality you can see of the person. And I guess it, to some people who were really hard-pressed, he told that story about Christ and the dead dog that the disciples were all saying, look at that dog, at that dog. And the Christ said to them, he says, yes, but look how white his teeth are. You may not be able to find much, but you turn to God and inspire me with the good things of my, my fellow believers here. And if we all do that and turn towards these qualities, we, we gradually change, transform by degrees our lives at the World Center. And we'll help each other to focus on this goal of drawing closer to the kingdom. This is the core, the heart of the faith is pulsing here. And we want it to pulse with all the right feelings. And I think we do. I mean, we go to the shrines. We have all kinds of advantages that, that help us. But we, we need to make 
this effort, I think, always to overcome our shortcomings and overcome viewing the shortcomings of others, putting up with them. You know? Well, I'm ready to do anything, but my coordinator... <laughs> <laughs> That, friends, is the field of sacrifice. One of the fields of sacrifice that we've got here. And it can make such a difference. And um, I can't speak for the House of Justice, but I can say, as a member of the House of Justice, how much it means when we see the believers here striving and studying and exerting themselves and trying, showing kindness to each other. Now, I know once in a while I come out, I'm so exhausted, I walk out the door, and I got this bag on my arm, and I'm thinking about some crisis in Pakistan or someplace, I don't know where, even where it is, and I pass you by, and I don't smile, and I don't say anything. And then I realize I've done that, and I see a look on a person's face like, oh my God, do they know about Tuesday? <laughs> I hear these rumors about, they say, you know, house members, they see around corners, they understand everything that's going on. <laughs> it's really Takistan. It's that place that had me depressed. So give us a break also, in case you don't see us being the best examples of this loving kindness all the time. We try, but... The community here is the source of our own buoyancy and upliftment. I mean, there's lots of sources, but it's one of the sources that uplifts the house members. When we see you radiant and happy, it makes us happy. The unity of mankind, the love, this love as the foundation of the unity of mankind. You know, he talks, Abdu'l-Baha talks in, in his, he makes these references in his speeches about the different kinds of unity and how they're all limited in character except spiritual unity. And the only way that we can create this new world is by individually, the Baha'is, being serious about these teachings about the love of God. It creates in us a predisposition to locking together with each other and with other souls, attracting other souls into uh, a crystallization, if you will, of something that's a clear reflection of the kingdom on high and the purpose of God and the meaning of Baha'u'llah's revelation. And Shoghi Effendi talks about these divine creative energies that have been released into the world. And they begin acting in human consciousness. And they crystallize and become sources for the refraction of spiritual light. And then, w in conjunction with each other, we create great collective centers, spiritual collective centers that attract other souls. But if we, if we disregard and are not attentive to the need to uphold unity, then we miss out on it. And uh, the whole process of the divine plan is delayed more. If the salt has lost its savor, as it says in the New Testament, how will it, how will it affect its season? So, uh, I remember hearing Horace Holly, 1958, he he was addressing the convention after the passing of the guardian. And he spoke on these themes of unity oftentimes. One of the things that he, he said is that the, um, the unity of the friends is not a decision amongst them to get along with each other and put up with each other's shortcomings. It far transcends that. It's the reflection in their hearts of the unity of God. And that unity of God, that love for God, that um, uh, viewing of his beauty is the means of attracting the believers together. And when they're attracted, then the rest of mankind follows suit. And this is the great challenge that we have. Through these instrumentalities, the plans that we have, all of the programs that we... Our own individual responsibility to repay God for having brought us into life, 
to repay Baha'u'llah for having breathed the breath of life, this breath of the Holy Spirit that he says is love, the essence of which is love, which produces this spirit of faith in us, a condition of faith that depends on his favors at all times. Not a decision we've made to believe in God or not believe in God. It's a, it's a, it's a living uh, presence in our being that inspires us with the truth and reality of the manifestation and therefore of God himself. He tells us that, uh, Abdu'l Baha says that it, it, our love uh, should be like the light of the sun. He's, ex he's calling upon the believers before he left North America. He said, your love should be like the light of the sun. The sun doesn't look to see where it's shining, whether it's shining on a worthy house or on a, a prosperous town or this is a place where righteous believers live, nothing like that. It shines because its nature is to shine. And he says that the love of God that we have in ourselves should not pick and choose who's worthy of getting it from us, but it should be that reflection of our own feeling of the presence of Baha'u'llah, of his blessings, of the inspiration that we have in ourselves. How can we move towards that? Again, he tells the believers, the example of the iron. He says the iron is hard and dark. And uh, he talk, talks about the influence of the love of God as transforming iron, like the fire transforms iron. The iron takes on, uh, it becomes fluid, it becomes incandescent, it glows, and it has heat to it, terrific heat to it whereas before it was cold. And he says these three qualities now should influence the human spirit through the effect of the word of God, through the love of God. We should be changed in that way. What a complete change it is. When you think of iron, I mean, the two conditions are totally different, just the opposite. And we have that capacity to reverse those conditions in ourselves that are not becoming and not attractive to God and to reach out for his good pleasure. And through that, pay homage to the love of God. Thank you.